Welcome to part three of lecture six of aerospace propulsion. So if we think about what's happening with the velocity and pressure, again, the, we have the velocity plot again at the top where we have a continuous increase in velocity. And because it's only at the disk that the stagnation pressure is changing, away from the disk, Bernoulli's equation must hold, must hold. So the stagnation pressure is constant. So this means that the velocity and the pressure must have an inverse relationship and where the velocity is increasing, the static pressure must be dropping. And then on the downstream side, again, the velocity is increasing, the static pressure must be dropping. But the far upstream and the far downstream static pressures are both P0. So there must be a rise of static pressure across the disk. And the static and stagnation pressure rises across the disk are equal because there's no change in velocity right at the disk. So the stagnation pressure is constant, jumps up, constant. Now we still haven't figured out what the velocity at the disk is. Um, we can relate it to the up and downstream flow conditions, and I'm not going to go through the derivation here. The derivation is in the MIT open courseware notes um, that there's a, uh, the address for here and that are also listed in the course syllabus. The result is that the velocity at the disk is the arithmetic average of the upstream and downstream velocities. So the velocity changes evenly split between the upstream and downstream regions. And the pressure difference is then related to the velocity change by applying Bernoulli's equation on both the upstream and downstream sides. We can get that the, the change in static pressure um, is equal to uh, the difference in the change in velocity squared times uh, rho over 2. Um, we generally have no way of knowing either UE or U disk. Um, so we want to express these things in terms of the stuff we do know, the flight velocity, probably we maybe know the thrust, and we typically would expect to know the disk area, which is, corresponds to the cross-sectional area of the propeller. So that exit velocity um, can be written in terms of a function of thrust and flight velocity, um, because these are normally would be known. Um, and of course, the, the disk area is just the, the propeller cross-sectional area, um, so it's related simply to the diameter. And um, we can work out that the uh, UE over U0 squared is the thrust divided by the area of the disk times uh, the free stream dynamic pressure plus 1. So now we're sort of getting somewhere. We can think about it in terms of the power, the power imparted to the fluid. Um, this is also purely a function of the design parameters. Again, this is derived in the MIT Open Course where notes that here's the result. Um, the power to the fluid is 1 half times the thrust times the flight speed, and then this expression for u over u naught squared that, uh, that we just had, um, square root, sorry, u over u naught plus 1. So this is the ideal power. Um, typically, you need about 15% more than this um, because of uh, the not having perfect efficiency of the propeller itself. So we can identify some trends from the equations we've put together now. So how do the propulsive efficiency expression that is up here, and the required power, the expression is here, change with propeller area, so with increasing propeller area, um, if the thrust and the flight speed are constant. So take a few minutes and think about this, and try to come up with your own answer um, before you move on to the next part of the video.